because last time we had no audio. So can someone let me know if you can hear me? Um, I did this video this morning and then I just rewatched it and I don't hear anything. So I'm not sure what might be wrong, but if someone could just let me know whether or not the audio um, seems to be on, can you hear me? Hey Patrick, can you let me know if you can hear me? I can't, I don't want to do this whole video again because I just did it a while ago and there was no audio. So if someone could just let me know whether or not you can actually hear me. Okay, good. So, excellent. Um, so the last time I did this video was a few weeks ago and um, about a previous student of mine. Oh, thanks, Tammy. Thank you. And uh, anyway, one of my consultant friends from Texas, Hal Bowman, the rock star of Teach Like a Rock Star, um, he called me the next day and he was like, um, yeah, Strobel, I woke up the next morning and I saw that video that you posted and I have to be honest, I thought maybe you'd been in the bottle all night. Uh, so if you remember, I had just come back from a run. I had had that encounter with my previous student, had my headband on, no makeup, which is 90% of the time anyway. Um, and I just jumped in front of the camera. So how I want you to know that today I not only put on some makeup, but I actually did my hair, which never happens unless I'm going to a school. Um, but don't be fooled by the scarf because I'm still in my running clothes. Uh, the other day, my son's best friend, Brayden, saw me in a pair of jeans. He's like, Kim, I've never seen you in a pair of jeans. So, I know, um, I need to work on my dress attire just a little bit. But, I don't know. Anyway, so, I've started a new routine this week. Um, I usually do my meditation in the evenings. Um, that's just always been my routine for years, but then sometimes I get really tired. And so, this week... I started, well, a few weeks ago, I started doing it um, outside, which I want to show you where it's at. Before I go, though, I want you to see my sweet little George who, who lays under the desk while I work all morning. Don't you, George? Are you going to say hi, George? So, um, I started doing my meditation in the morning because it just kind of allows me to get connected to spirit, to get myself grounded and to set my intentions for the day. And I want to show you where I've been doing it out lately. This is my view. And yes, you're going to see like all these towels and blankets all over this furniture because my dogs love to jump up there. But this is the special meditation spot right here. Um, but anyways, I've also this week started waking up an hour earlier. Come on, Georgie. Are you coming inside? George has to follow me everywhere. I've started waking up like at quarter till six just because um, I've, I have found that if I can get an extra hour in my day, then I can get through my to-do list, which is really, really long and really, really stressful right now. So by eight o'clock this morning, I walked my dogs. I had meditated. Um, it was a day off from running, and so I got busy in the Strobel Ed office. And so um, last night, I stayed up until like 11.30 um, just working on my presentations for next week in Evansville. I'm teaching standards-based grading and assessing on Monday. And Tuesday, I'm teaching close reading and text-dependent questioning. Um, and so I'm super, super, super jazzed about these topics. Like I'm a total geek. I start like going through all of my books and rereading them for the 15th time. Um, I love School Leadership Guide. I love Classroom Assessment, all of this by Robert Marzano. I love formative assessment in standards-based grading. I love everything from Rick Wormelli. Um, fair isn't always equal. So last night I just got in this zone and this flow and I was like working on my PowerPoint, tweaking my hand out, had all my materials here and I finally shut it down at 1130. But here's some of the research I uncovered again. And I think that's why I get so excited for our students because Robert Marzano has been a teacher for 40 years and now he's like a super 
researcher and he does study after study after study and he knows what works with kids and so one of the statistics one of the pieces of research i found uh which i i had known about but when a child has one of the most effective teachers that child can expect a 52 percentile gain and when a child has the least effective teacher, they can expect a 14 point percentile gain. And six of those 14 points are just because the child's a year older. And so, oh, I see Amanda's on here. I will say, I'm not her evaluator, but Mrs. Atkins would definitely be considered one of the most effective teachers. Spencer's always coming home telling me how hard her class is. Well, I love that her class is difficult. I will take him getting a C in a difficult class any day over him getting an A in an easy class. Um, so I appreciate everything that she does. But when you look at those statistics and you see how important it is on a student's achievement to be highly effective. Not only that, but Doug Reeves says that if you want to make one change that would immediately reduce failure rates, the most effective place to start is to challenge the current grading system. You see guys, the grading system that we currently use, K-12 and all the way up into college, really has a lot of flaws. It, it actually came out of a test that was created for the military back in like 1917, and that's all we've known, so that's what we've used. But there's three major issues. The first is that we have a completely flawed scale. We have a 100 point scale and 60 points are reserved for the F and eight or 10 points are reserved for the A. So we already set kids up to fail when we've given them 60 points to fail and only eight or 10 to, to get an A. And so what we first have to do is we have to come up with an equally proportionate scale. We want the same amount to be between the A and the B, the B and the C, the C and the D. The second issue is that teachers always weigh items differently. When I was a fourth grade teacher, I would give a reading assessment on a novel and the teacher next door would be giving the exact same reading, uh, they'd be reading the same novel and he'd be given his reading assessment and I will tell you, it was completely different than mine. My assessments were like, 10 essay questions all about the comprehension and the deep thinking of the novel. And his were more like uh, multiple choice, self-selected, matching, true, false. So his kind of had to focus on the simpler skills and mine had to focus on the more complex skills. Mine wasn't better than his, his wasn't better than mine. The issue was that we needed to be giving the same type of assessments. We, because an A in my class should have been the same as an A in his class, and it wasn't. I needed an assessment that had comp some more simpler skills on it, because I didn't test that. I was only testing the meat and potatoes of it, and his probably needed a few more complex types of questions. And so in standards-based grading, what we do is we begin to align some of those assessments, and we use a proficiency scale that ensures that when we go to score an assessment, that it's being matched up to the exact same criteria so that we know this is the level of expectancy. And so that's the second issue. So one is you have a flawed scale. Two is teachers who are extremely educated in what they're doing just make different decisions. They have different professional judgments. And so they, they make their test and their assessments uh, with different complexities. The third issue is this whole idea of averaging. What we do is we take all of these scores and then we lump them together into one final reading score, social studies score, biology score, um, math score. And this is not, averaging doesn't work in this system and here's why. I was working in an elementary school a few years ago and there was a little first grade girl and she was doing her math or her addition times test. And the very first time she did it, she got like a 20 out of 100. And then the next week she got a 41. And then the next week she got a 59. And the next week she got a 62. And by weeks eight and nine, she was in the 80s. But here's the deal. She will never recover from that 20 out of 100 that she got 
and then that next low score. She'll never recover, even though at the end of the grading period, she knew her, um, her addition facts pretty well. It doesn't matter because we average scores. And so what that the score at the end needs to do is it needs to be the score that best represents the child's level of knowledge today, not four or five or six weeks ago when I was just teaching that topic, when they were just learning and growing with that topic. And so in standards-based grading, what we do is we say, what is the score today at the end of the nine weeks, when I look across these scores for this particular skill, and that's the other thing with standards-based grading, we don't lump everything together. We want you to know exactly, is it adding and subtracting fractions that your child's having difficulty with? Is it multiplying factors? Is it division? Um, you know, what is the specific skill? But then we look across the, the trend and we say, what is the score that best represents the child's level of knowledge today? And that sets up a growth mindset for the child. And so I get super, super, super jazzed when I think about how we need to reevaluate and rethink our current beliefs with our education system as far as the grading practices. Um, and so that's one topic. The other topic is close reading. That's happening next Tuesday in Evansville at the Hilton Garden Inn. But I get to go do that tomorrow at Breckenridge for the entire school corporation. Um, I'm teaching the entire school corporation close reading and text dependent questions. I have this really great um, presentation prepared. I feel like I know the content well, and I'm super excited because it's going to help all of their students, but especially their struggling readers. Um, and so we're teaching that tomorrow. I did some work with Breckenridge schools this summer, and they called me back uh, for tomorrow and then next week in Evansville. And then um, I run the marathon in Chicago next Sunday, and after that, I have like the entire month of October, which I purposely, a few months ago, slated off. I am not in schools in October unless I just go volunteer to teach some lessons around here, which is a possibility. But I have no gigs on purpose because I'm creating the entire winter series, which is going to be about um, professional development on growth mindset, you know, and developing grit and resiliency in our kids um, and genius hour, incorporating a genius hour. You know, Google has this really great philosophy. If you work for Google, they mandate that 20% of your week, your work week, be spent researching, exploring, investigating a topic that is completely unrelated to your job description. And what Google has found is that 80% of their best ideas come from the 20% of time they give their work employees time to explore and investigate and learn topics of interest. And so Genius Hour is based on this exact same idea because we've kind of lost, oh, not kind of, we've really lost the creativity in the school system. You know, it's been all about reading and writing and math. And, and those skills are important. And if you're not strong in those skills, we need you to develop some grit because we need to get you strong in those skills. But there are so many other ways for students to be smart. And there are many, many different creative outlets for them to be able to use in the classroom. And so with Genius Hour, I'm going to teach teachers how to incorporate that, how to incorporate a space in the week where children and students can research and investigate topics that are of interest to them. I was in a high school a few years ago and there was a sewing machine in the language arts room. And I asked my friend Molly, I'm like, Molly, why do you have a sewing machine in here? And she goes, oh, we're doing genius hour. She's got, I've got a girl who's always wanted to learn how to sew. She's learning to sew. I have another student who is creating a genealogy binder for his mom for Christmas. I have another student who is working on a website for her aunt's bakery. And she goes, Kim, I have to tell you, I'm teaching those standards. Even though I'm giving them this period once a week, you would not believe how it's changed the culture of my classroom and the learning that's taking place. And in all reality, isn't that really what it's about? It's about the learning. It's not about the grade. It's about the learning that takes place. And so the entire month of October, I'm going to be working on those workshops that will launch in January. Um, and I'm so glad that a few months ago I saved myself some or I made a really good decision and decided that after October 8th, the rest of October was going to be spent working from home, creating the winter series of workshops. Um, now, before I leave, I want to give you an update on the student that I did a video for a few weeks ago. That, there's my mama. Um, that video 
uh, was shared by so many people and it ended up getting like 16,000 views. And the reason that I love that is because I felt like we were able to get the message out to people that these are the kinds of students that we serve in our schools. That students come to us with so many different types of challenges, so many that we cannot control. And, you know, it's funny, at the end of the day, even when I go to present these workshops, you know, I'm super excited about the topics that I'm teaching. But if at the end of the day on those workshops, the teachers know that the number one thing that matters is that they've loved those students and that that trumps any topic or any standard that they teach, then I know that I've done my job because that's exactly what our teachers are doing with our kids. They're loving our kids because so many of our kids do um, struggle and they do come from different backgrounds. And so the particular student that I reached out to with a live video a few weeks ago, um, you know, I was amazed at the support, the community. I, I, I got so many messages of people wanting to help or donate items. We were able to deliver bags of towels and sheets and beds and diapers for their little six month old and little clothing for her because she didn't have a lot of clothing. Um, we had people who gave <laughs> knife sets and plates and cups and just completely got this family set up in their apartment. And I was overwhelmed by how our community came together. I mean, I even had people from like New York and Maryland who saw the video who emailed me and wanted to deposit money in a PayPal account. And I, I mean, how nice was that? But I told them, look, we've got this taken care of because the community support was outstanding. And so I think that says a lot about the type of community that we live in and the people around it. Um, they wanted to jump in and they felt for this child. And, you know, I think he's making some positive steps. Um, you know, I've learned a long time ago that you can't do it for the person. Uh, he has to do it for himself, and I hope he chooses to, um, but it's a long road for him. And, you know, I think that at least we've given him a life raft. At least we've, um, we've given him a little bit of hope. We've let him know that he's not alone. And um, so I just wanna thank everybody for, for your contributions to him and, and to his family, to his wife, and to his little six-month-old baby. Um, it was really sweet. Even just last week, like one of my friends came over and she had this big box of diapers and she had some cute little winter pajamas and outfits for their little girl. And, you know, when she walked away, I, I just once, once again reminded of the goodness in people. So anyway, um, I just wanted to give you a little update on him. And now I see my clock and I have the most amazing date with the most remarkable lady. The one that I've had a standing lunch date for 16 years on Fridays, but since I'm out of school tomorrow, we've had to move it till today. So I better let you go because I am headed to have lunch with my Gramsci at Julie's Cafe. And those ladies, especially Miss uh, uh, Mindy, is going to be shocked because she never sees me in makeup and all she sees me in is running clothes. And today I'm all jazzed up. I've got makeup on. I've got my hair done. I even threw a scarf on. So watch out, Mindy. I know you're going to want to give me a hug when you see me. Anyway, have a great day, guys. Thanks for joining us.